So I will get us started. So welcome everyone. Um, my name is Mary Eleanor Power and I am the Director of Marketing and Communications for Dalhousie University's College of Continuing Education. And I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar focused on sustainable energy technologies. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Dalhousie University is located in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We are all treaty people. And today I'd like to start by introducing our two uh, speakers. We're delighted to have both of you with us um, who are both with Blocks EDU, but have um, different backgrounds. So I'll start with Shaheen. And uh, Shaheen is uh, with us uh, and is the instructor of the courses um, that we'll be, I'm telling you a little bit about later on in sustainable energy technology. So Shaheen has a background in engineering, uh, specializing in microgrid design, feasibility and technical due diligence. She has extensive experience in the sustainable energy sector, working for nonprofit organizations, startups, academic institutions and the private sector. Today, she works at the conservation finance organization, Coast Funds, and Shaheen, as I said, is the instructors of these courses uh, through Blocks EDU. And then I'd also like to introduce George Levy. Uh, so George is the founder and chief learning officer at Blockchain Institute of Technology, a leading professional training and certification organization focused on blockchain technology and cryptocurrency. George is also department head of blockchain at Blocks, 80, Blocks EDU, a provider of quality courseware for universities, colleges, and education providers with clients worldwide. A dynamic, fully bilingual English and Spanish keynote speaker, George is the creator and online instructor of many best-selling and top-rated courses. And George, I know you'll be asking some questions of Shaheen, and, and the two of you will, um, through this Q&A, will be answering a lot of questions that are on our minds about sustainable energy technology. So uh, please, by all means, take it away. Thank you very much, Mary Eleanor, and great to speak with you, Shaheen. Uh, I've been wanting to talk to you for some time. A uh, lot of activity going on right now in sustainable energy. And, uh, and I wanted to, uh, I'm very excited about this opportunity because actually I want to ask some questions and hopefully by asking these questions, I'll let you be able to fill in all the missing knowledge. Fair? Sounds fair to me, George. Great. So one thing I was actually, uh, I was, uh, I'm very excited about the fact that my wife just got a, uh, my wife just got a Tesla and, uh, mind you, I still have a gas car, but this is new to me. And, uh, and I want to put things in context because we are talking about renewable energies. You know, we got the electric factor and I saw this article that Ottawa invests billions in zero emission buses. So I want to get from your take, right? Cause here I am from the outside up. I'm in the blockchain space. I know there's a lot of activity with carbon credits being used in, uh, on blockchain technology. So there's some intersects there, but you are the expert in this space. So if you could tell me more, more or less the current state and where you see this whole use of these sustainable energy and climate change interacting in the year 2021. Sure, yeah, it's, it's interesting that you bring up this article because it was just from a few weeks ago. So it's really, really current news. And if we're going to talk about the current state of climate change in the year 2021, um, the science and reality hasn't really changed for the last three decades. So in order to talk about what we know today in 2021, we need to look back and go back in history to the Industrial Revolution, which unlocked a whole new energy source, as we know, fossil fuels. So coal, oil, gas, what your car and what my car run on too, they've been a fundamental driver of the technological and economic progress and growth since the 18th century. So we use these fossil fuels to power our industries and it was only in the, in the 1950s when it was discovered that the consequence of burning fossil fuels meant that greenhouse gases were starting to accumulate in our atmosphere. And as we all know, of course, greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide trap some of the Earth's outgoing energy and retains heat in the atmosphere. And this heat causes changes in the radiative balance of the Earth. And these alter climate and weather, weather patterns. Um, and that's why we've been seeing extreme weather events, such as the hurricanes that you were talking about earlier in mm -hmm. Miami, the flooding in Bangladesh, wildfires here in BC, and um, even the, the recent cold snap that you, George, unfortunately experienced last month in Texas. Mm -hmm. And so for the last 
800,000 years, much longer than human civilization, the concentration of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere was, it was between 200 and 280 parts per million. And today, March 2021, the concentration of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere is 410 parts mm. per million. And this number is climbing every day. So it's doubled since we started burning fossil fuels. And the concerning part, I think, is that this higher concentration of greenhouse gases will result in further disruption of climate and weather and will lead to the dismantling of ecosystems that we rely on for food and water and basic survival. So our current knowledge of climate change is grim um, and it's nothing we haven't heard before. And it will just continue to get worse um, if we continue as business as usual. One of the things that I found most interesting about this fact, and I'm gonna go back to my Tesla example. So my wife, one thing that I'll tell you is just immediately obvious. I went to the gas pump and uh, here in the US right now, there's since the change of administration, the gas prices have gone up dramatically. So I feel it in my wallet. My wife went to charge her car and it was like chump change. It was so, so much more efficient. But beyond that, it's the factor of the impact. And I think that's the point that I wanted to talk about because what, what this program, the whole goal, and what I feel about all this thing is that yes, there's all this growth and all these greenhouse gases, but unless people change their behaviors, unless we change the technology, unless more and more people move to electric instead of using the gas, right? That, that will not have the impact that's required. So let me ask you specifically, being in Canada, what's Canada, beyond merely getting these uh, zero emission buses, what's being done to actually address this climate change? Yeah, that's a big question. Um, and I think we can, look at, we can look at Canada as a nation, as a whole, but energy and putting a price on carbon are areas that are shared between the federal and provincial governments. So let's talk about Canada first a bit and then zoom into the provinces. Um, Canada in 2015, as we all know, signed onto the Paris Climate Accord and released a national climate plan with a goal to reduce 30% of its emissions by the year 2030. So here we are five years in, and it's unclear if we're on track to meet that target, but I think it's undeniable that there are efforts being made with policy changes and committed funding for a sustainable path forward. Um, so for example, the, the news article that you opened us with today, the, the federal government and it's committed billions for electrified transit, um, and then it's also put a price on carbon. And so there, those are a couple of examples of federal action. But if we take a look at actions taken by the provinces, um, Ontario, for example, they've phased out coal entirely from their electricity supply. And here where I am in BC, there's the Clean BC Initiative, which has committed funds to support off-grid communities to transition away from their diesel-based fuel and towards renewable energy. And that's the main area that, that I work in today. Um, in Nova Scotia, for example, you have Efficiency Nova Scotia, which I think is, the, is Canada's first and only energy efficiency utility. And uh, they fund energy efficiency and conservation activities. And from what I've read, they've already helped 400,000 Nova Scotians complete energy efficiency projects, saved over 180 million in annual energy bills and avoided or are avoiding um, a million tons of greenhouse gases from going into the atmosphere each year. So there's a long list of different projects um, and different programs and initiatives underway in every province and territory, but we still need to do more. And that's why it's not just about government action. I think that mitigating climate change is going to require more action, not only from governments, but also from the private sector. 
My question to you would be, as a professor, a lot of the focus that I have is on what are the big areas of opportunity for the people that actually take my courses. So I can talk about all the areas available in the blockchain space, but in the renewable sector, in the sustainable energy space, what are areas of opportunity and, and, and investment that's happening right now in the renewable space where people could be looking at as potential maybe career, career angles? What should people be focusing on right now? Yeah, that's, um, that's a great question. I think when it comes to investment, um, there's absolutely lots of investment going on. So if we take the example of big tech, for example, um, big tech companies like Google, Amazon, they've become the dominant buyers of clean power mm. and their influence is huge. The combined power usage of Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and Apple is more than 45 terawatt hours a year, which is about the same as New Zealand as a country. And their demand for power is only going to increase in the years ahead because those data centers that consume so much power, they're not going to get any smaller in our digital age. So there's significant opportunities for investment. Um, you have Microsoft, which is vowed to be carbon negative by 2030 which means that it will pull more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere than it emits per year. And they also use an internal carbon price of $15 a ton. And they actually bill each of their team for their emissions, which incentivizes staff to, to use less electricity. Another example is Google, which is pledged to run all of its data centers on carbon-free electricity by the year 2030. And it's not just big tech. It's also big oil. Um, many, many oil and gas companies are positioning themselves for a, a transition. And the exciting thing is that I don't, I don't think it's greenwashing anymore. Um, Shell, for example, has many on and offshore wind and solar projects. And it announced earlier this year that it's investing $2 billion a year in wind and solar and also biomass, hydrogen, and EV charging infrastructure. And the same thing with Suncor this um, Albertan oil sands company that I worked for seven years ago, Suncor is expanding its EV charging network through Petro Canada. And it also has its biofuel projects. And it's also uh, investing in research into sustainable aviation fuel. And they also have several wind projects across the country. And so it's in addition to big tech and big oil, it's also, as you mentioned earlier, the, the car companies. It's um, all the major automakers now, not just, not just Tesla, have already have plans to unveil fully electric cars and not just plug-in hybrids anymore. And actually last year, BMW announced that its electric cars will use battery cells produced using renewable energy. And this will address the upstream emissions associated with manufacturing the vehicles, not just driving the vehicles. So, all in all, there's significant investment opportunity and um, in the renewable energy industry. And actually, uh, there was an article from Goldman Sachs last year where they shared their expectation that spending for renewable power projects will become the largest area of energy spending this year in 2021. And it will surpass oil and gas for the first time in history. And so, and they also uh, expected that clean energy will reach a $16 trillion investment volume wow. through 2030 and wow. eventually eclipse fossil fuels. You know, the interesting thing is like one thing that keeps going, and by the way, one of the things that I find interesting about this, and I'm sure all this will be covered in the certificate, uh, is that you are you have a lot of language when you talk like biomass, EV, there's a lot of like terminology that's that's actually the kind of terminology that's needed if you're actually gonna be working in that space. All of this is covered in the certificate, yes? Yes. Um, well, the certificate, and I should correct you, I'm not a professor. <laughs> just well, but I'm, I'm, okay, fair enough. <laughs> uh, the, the certificate. You're the instructor uh, in the course. Yep. Yes. Uh, if we're going to talk about terminology, I just thought I'd throw that out there. But fair enough. the course is focusing on, so the, the first module is more um, broad on electricity generation in, in, in general. The second one is completely based on wind, and the third is on solar. And so we will talk about biomass, geothermal, EV, but 
there won't be any deep dives into those technologies. Fair enough. But uh, and and the reason I'm saying it is because there's a language to it. And and I'll give you a perfect example. Like right now in my context, I was thinking cryptocurrency mining. Yes. So when you think about Bitcoin mining, it's very energy intensive. There's a lot of electricity required, and a lot of people saying that Bitcoin mining is is contributing to a lot of the carbon that's actually being released. And, uh, and the fact is, what people don't know is that many of the major Bitcoin farming, uh, Bitcoin farms are actually moving to green energy. So the sustainable energy is actually having a big impact in that space as well. So uh, it's truly a, a big, big, big opportunity. Now, my question to you would be, um, just like I said, in Bitcoin, some people say that it's very energy, con you know, very intensive. It really just, you, need, you use a lot of electricity to do Bitcoin mining. Are there any challenges with renewable energy that we should be aware of? Yes. Um, yeah, there are challenges with any kind of energy. And, and renewable energy, as a term, is a, is a big net. And so, of course, it depends on what kind of renewable energy source you're talking about. But all of them come with their challenges. Um, for example, if we talk about hydroelectricity, which is the dominant form of power here in BC, it's, it's about 90% of our electricity supply. It comes with its challenges. Land needs to be flooded. Capital costs are incredibly high. And the smaller isolated hydro systems in remote communities are susceptible to summer drought and even winter freezing. Um, but this challenge can be overcome by diversifying the grid and in BC, the provincial grid has many, has very many large dams, um, which increase reliability. So that's one challenge with hydroelectricity specifically. Um, wind and solar, as you know, are intermittent sources of power. So when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing, electricity isn't being produced. And the challenge uh, is being addressed by large scale energy storage systems. So just as we've talked about already with um, electric lithium ion buses and um, your wife's new Tesla, batteries will be a large solution to intermittent renewables. And utility scale batteries have already been installed in Australia and Hawaii to help smooth out intermittent solar generation there. And in addition to these large utility scale batteries, there's also considerable growth in, in smaller behind the meter storage. So what I mean for that, by that is, for example, in Germany, 40% of the recent rooftop solar applications have been installed with behind the meter batteries on private property. Mm -hmm. And this distribution and decentralization of energy supply um, will only strengthen the reliability of power. So I don't think we have time today to discuss the challenges with other forms of renewable energy, like geothermal, biomass, tidal, but each comes with a set of unique challenges and each has uh, will have innovative solutions in order to address those challenges. Um, one challenge that I think is shared among all renewable energy projects is that they require a relatively high capital investment when compared to fossil fuel projects. Mm -hmm. So this high initial cost is followed by decades of low operating costs because the fuel is essentially free. So um, operating these projects doesn't require purchasing a fuel to, to produce power, unless you're mm. talking about biomass. But, but for all other renewable energies, these annual operating costs are only the maintenance of the technology and replacement of parts. One thing that I've noticed in, in the space of what I, my focus has been, you know, blockchain, Bitcoin, and cryptocurrencies, the cryptocurrency space has also been impacted over the, I'll tell you a perfect example, we're going to talk about COVID. So when it comes to COVID, there's been a big move towards being cashless. Like you go to places, many places don't take dollars. They don't want to take your money. They want to just work digital payments. So that's been a big impact as people are becoming more and more comfortable with doing digital payments, being able to more like not physical. What kind of impact, if any, has COVID had in the whole uh, renewable energy space? Has there been any? Um, despite Despite the economic downturn, um, renewable energy has actually continued to grow in 2020. And um, renewables are, are continuing to increase in their competitiveness. Um, and I think this is because their modularity, their scal scalability and uh, job creation potential. Um, 
these three things make these projects highly attractive as countries and communities evaluate their economic recovery options. Um, so renewable energy and new projects could form key components of economic stimulus plans this year and the years ahead. And if we take um, our own country for an example, the Canada Infrastructure Bank will invest two and a half billion in clean power generation and transmission and storage over the next three years and uh, plans to invest five billion in clean power over the medium term. And there's also um, clean energy as part of economic recovery in the European Union, in South Korea, the United States, Denmark, um, pretty much most of the countries that I've researched that have a pandemic recovery plan mm -hmm. do have a green component of that recovery plan. So it's pretty much, it's, it's, it's the path forward for many countries, just basically looking away out of this COVID pandemic. It's a huge investment opportunity and it represents opportunities for people that can be educated and can actually participate in this. That's actually very, very valuable to know. Uh, well, actually I, I feel, thank you very much for, uh, for sharing all that information. Uh, Mary Eleanor, I, uh, I, I want to appreciate the opportunity to speak with you, Shaheen. Thank you very much. That was very informative. Thank you. Thank you, George. That's great. And so I'll, um, I'll just bring up my uh, screen here and just give you a sense of, of what uh, you can expect in the certificate. So we'll just go through this. Um, and, uh, and then want to make sure that we have enough time to answer any questions. I haven't seen any come through, but thanks so much, Shaheen and George, for, for walking us through some of the, the most um, urgent or pressing or most interesting um, kind of topics. And I'm sure there are many, many more within this space. So just to give you a sense of, of what you can expect in this certificate. Um, so it is 100% online. Um, and there are three modules or three courses. Um, each of which are, are four weeks long. And uh, the first course, our module, starts on April 1st. So that first module, I won't, I won't read this for you in detail because um, we do have a website that you can go to where you can read over this uh, um, at your leisure. Um, but the first, the first module will give you just that fundamentals, that foundational um, learning. And, uh, and then you'll move on to focusing on wind, en wind energy um, and some of the aspects of, of that, uh, that kind of one pillar or one, one section of the industry. And then moving on to solar energy to round out um, those three courses. And so who should attend? So certainly, uh, you know, this, this certificate is open to those who are looking to pivot in their careers or change careers, um, who want to enhance their resume and marketability in the clean technology job market, um, industry executives, uh, and who are looking for uh, certification, um, project managers, developers, investors, interested in expanding their career or business with renewable energy. And certainly as Shaheen and, and George have covered, there's a lot of, lot of opportunity for growth um, and a lot of opportunity with part of that growth um, for, for careers um, and, and certainly for, for long-term long jobs in this, uh, in this space. So the benefit and the uniqueness of the certificate, not only it's, is, it, is it condensed in its, uh, in its format and 100% and online to make it easier for those who are currently working to be able to take it, um, is that it can also lead to this designation and, and certification. So um, after the completion of these three courses, you are able to then um, take the exam or, or are encouraged to take the exam to then become certified. I and mean, then we do have a link so that you can read more about this certification. And those are here. So if you were to visit dell.ca slash SET for sustainable energy technologies, you would find um, certainly a, a more comprehensive listing overview of those courses um, and the pricing for those courses. As well, this is the link for um, finding out more information about that exam, about that certifying exam and what that will entail. Um, I would encourage you if you have any questions um, to reach out to Julie Webb, who is our program manager, and she can answer any of those. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure Julie would, would loop in as necessary, Shaheen, if there are any specific questions about some of the learning that you'll undertake in these courses. 
Okay. And so thank you for, uh, for giving me the opportunity there to just kind of walk through uh, the certificate itself. Um, and, uh, and now I'm happy to open it to any questions um, and, uh, and any other discussion in the last few minutes that we have. So please feel free uh, to add some questions in the chat. And if not, I'm happy to jump in with a question of my own. And maybe I'll just get us started there. Um, so Shaheen, can you give us a sense, you know, we talk about the courses, I um, mean, a lot of our courses across the college are, are offered 100% online, but what does that look like for learning for this particular certificate? Kind of exactly how it sounds, 100% online. Um, the, the benefit though, is that it's not just a one-way street. Um, it's, it won't be me speaking for an hour um, to the screen. There's also quizzes, there's assignments, there's a question and answer period after each um, session. And honestly, students can learn about renewable energy anywhere. They can go onto the International Energy Agency website and look at the energy outlooks that are published every year. There's um, courses offered that are out there. There's a Canadian Renewable Energy Association um, countless places where, where you can absorb content and, and current news about renewables. Um, but I think that the difference with this Dalhousie course is that you're invited to challenge that Foundational Technologies Institute exam afterwards and earn a professional designation um, that will allow you to put sustainable energy professional onto your um, your your list of experience and your, your credentials. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, and so there's a question here from uh, Yutheni. Do you talk about climate change and how that impacts renewables? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, climate change will, will impact everything. And I think I alluded to this a little bit with um, hydroelectric systems earlier and, and the challenges associated with hydroelectricity, for example, um, as extreme weather patterns continue to get worse, um, we're going to see more freezing um, of those small run of river projects. We're going to see more um, droughts that dry up those run of rivers. So there's going to be climate change will impact um, renewable energy just as it will impact um, other sources of power, just as we saw, um, like I spoke about a little bit earlier with Texas, when those um, devastating power outages happened, that was because none of the energy systems were designed for those cold temperatures in Texas. Mm -hmm. There's a question here, it just came in through the Q&A. Um, can you give perhaps some examples of jobs that may be available? Sure. Um, I can talk a little bit from my my own experience. Um, the The job that I that I hold now, renewable energy specialist at Coast Funds, um, this job supports First Nations communities in BC to transition away from diesel based power generation to renewable energy. So, a lot of the off grid communities in BC that are far away from the grid and are too expensive to connect to the grid, rely completely on diesel power. And many of these communities are along the coast. So you have to ship in diesel fuel on a boat. And that comes with a host of other risks, um, spills and contamination of, of, of soils and um, harvesting sites. So the job that I'm, that I'm doing now is um, supporting these communities um, in, in this transition and uh, working for this conservation finance organization to help with the funding for that. So the jobs are like, I didn't know this was a, a job. I didn't know that this was a potential um, place to even work when I was studying. Um, but as the world starts to turn its eye more towards a sustainable path, there will be jobs like this one and so many others that come up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I don't see any other questions that are coming in right now, but that was a, that was a great one. Um, other jobs include um, 
manufacturing, for example, um, wind turbine uh, components, um, feasibility, how much energy can you produce from a potential wind or solar site based on the data that you receive. So um, to measure wind data, you put up a, a MET tower and then install anemometers and measure wind speed for a year, but somebody has to determine to turn that wind speed into kilowatt hours per year produced. So that's another job. There's just, there's so many that are along the, the um, supply chain or the uh, so many parts that need to come together to actually develop a project. And so, Shaheen, can you give us a sense? So I, I, you know, would be, would consider myself be far and away from, uh, you know, working in the sustainable energy, energy sector, which is perhaps unfair to my, my background, which would be in marketing communications. And so I, I could even see myself in that space because someone has to communicate what's, what's happening and communicate it in a way that people understand and buy into and question and challenge and all of that. Um, so can you give a sense of, of, for those who might feel intimidated by the, the topic or feel that they need some kind of technical background before going into the certificate, what they might expect um, and, and perhaps relieve some of those anxieties that people might have that they're not um, adequately prepared or educated to, to join this, uh, this certificate? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question because I tend to um, get siloed in my own type of work. And because I come from a technical background, that's usually where my, my thoughts go. But absolutely, you don't need a technical background to work in renewable energy. Um, one example is um, when, I, when I worked for Suncor, as I mentioned earlier, um, in order to develop a wind project, there needs to be open houses done to um, inform and um, per, and get feedback from the community that, are, that is going to be surrounding this potential project. And as you mentioned earlier, Mary Eleanor, there needs to be people who are, who are skilled at communicating how this project will impact the community, what effects they're going to see, um, what they can expect, um, and, and answer all of their questions. And so mm -hmm. um, with a background in communications, there absolutely needs to be um, people with those skills and training to, to enter the renewable energy space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just one final question, uh, and we do have people who are still kind of hanging on, so thanks very much, even though we're just a few minutes past our time, but I'll just round us out with this question. So is the, certif is the certi certification excuse me, known and recognized by most employers, and is it recognized internationally? That's a good question, um, Matthew. I, the, the certification uh, is definitely known and recognized in Canada because it is a Canadian institute that, that is providing this. Um, regarding international recognition, I think that's something that I'll have to, have to look into and get back to you. I'm not, I'm not too sure about that. What I would say, and I would add to that, when the Foundational Technologies Institute is internationally recognized, so you get both. You get you get the opportunity not only for the Dalhousie reputation and the history of Dalhousie, but you also get the backing of the Foundational Technologies Institute. So this is an opportunity to really just like cement and solidify the knowledge that you've taken. So if what you're looking for is, can you get vouched that you truly gathered that information? You get both the reputation of the Dalhousie University, but also the, uh, the backing of the Foundational Technologies Institute. And that is an international organization as well. Thanks That's for clarifying, great. George. Mm -hmm. And, and because I, I actually get those questions as well for the blockchain certificates. And, uh, and that's been, it truly is a global audience. You know, we got people, a lot of the students come from other countries and they're saying, well, is, is this recognized? And yes, you know, Dalhousie has an incredible reputation, but also the Foundational Technologies Institute adds to that. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. I, uh, I, will, I will wrap us up uh, for now, but uh, I'll also just remind those who are still joining us that we will be sending out an email later today that will have a recording of today's webinar, along with a link, uh, the links that I've included um, in the chat here. Uh, so a link to find out more information about the courses and about the certificate. Uh, and, uh, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, and can certainly connect you with George and Shaheen if there are any specific, um, or perhaps Shaheen as the instructor, um, more uh, information that's specific to the courses. So thanks so much, George and Shaheen, for joining us. Really, really appreciate your time. 
uh, and sharing some of your expertise. So uh, thank you once again and take care everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you kindly. Wishing the best Thanks to everybody everyone. in the audience as well. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye.